Good morning. Today's announcements are for week beginning the 5th of June and the service you will be watching is from Sunday 29th of May and was led by Dr Stephen Looney. For some time the Congregational Committee has been considering the layout at the front of the church. It now has a plan to put to the congregation at a meeting to be held in the church at 7pm on Tuesday the 7th of June. Our taxi service to church is now back up and running and if you wish to use this service, please contact your elder or the church office. Next week, the 12th of June, the service will be led by Fiona Gray. These are all the announcements. Good morning. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone to our service this morning uh, and for the benefit of those joining us online, this is the 29th of May. You're especially welcome if you're visiting uh, and we welcome back to our pulpit this morning, Dr. Stephen Looney. For some time, the Congregational Committee has been considering the layout at the front of the church and now uh, has a plan to put to the congregation uh, at a meeting of the congregation in church on Tuesday the 7th of June at 7 p.m. So everyone's welcome to come to that meeting, but those who are communicant members are the ones entitled to vote on the proposals. Copies of a booklet called A Life of Devotion, Bible Readings to Commemorate the Queen's Jubilee are also available from the information desk. Next Sunday, the 5th of June, the service will be led by the Reverend Robert Bell, formerly Minister of Ballyclare. This will be our June Communion, and again we will be using the pre-packed elements uh, as we've done for the last two years. Uh, the Boys Brigade uh, Heritage Museum uh, is opening up in the De Courcy Centre in Carrick between the 1st and 24th of June. So if you've an interest in Boys Brigade, uh, please go along and support them uh, and see the various things they have on display. Within the last few days, the Linkage Commission in Church House has granted Joy Mount leave to call a new minister. Um, there's been a lot happening since Richard retired uh, at the end of December, uh, but we've finally got permission now to call a new minister. So that's an important step in the life of our congregation. These are all of the announcements. Please stand to receive the word of God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Thank you again for your very warm words of welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, for those of you who remember me being here before, uh, you will notice that my voice is now another octave lower than it was. Uh, I do not have COVID. I have my negative test beside me, but I do have the cold. Uh, so you will my apologies if the pitch is even lower than ever it was. Let's turn to our God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we hear your words of your call to worship from the Psalm number 95 when we hear it say, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we hear those words from the Psalms calling us to sing and shout aloud to the rock of our salvation, to praise you with music and song, and soon we will sing a great hymn to your praise, filled with words that speak of your grace and mercy, words that tell of your greatness, telling it to the very ends of the earth. And we need those two things, Lord. We need your grace and we need your mercy. We need your mercy because in the days that have passed since we last came to worship you, there are ways that we have failed you. Failed you and failed those around us. 
We need your mercy because even in the hours that have passed since this time yesterday, there are ways that we have sinned against you and against those around us. And so we come into your presence this morning, thinking of your greatness, thinking of how you are the one true God, and it is by the mere fact of coming into your presence, the presence of the living God, that we become aware of our need for your mercy. Yet, Lord, you extend to us not only your mercy to forgive us our sins when we confess them to you, but you also extend to us your grace. Not counting our sins against us, you clothe us in the righteousness of Christ, the perfect sacrifice in our place for our sins. You clothe us in his perfection so that we might come into your presence to bring you our praise and thanksgiving. And soon we will do just that in the words of our hymn. Hear our praise this morning, Lord as we sing and shout aloud to the rock of our salvation and we tell of your unnumbered blessings to us. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. And so we come to sing this morning of God's love for us in that beautiful hymn, hymn number 509, Love Divine. Let's stand and praise our God.
invite you to turn with me to God's Word, this time reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and we'll be beginning at the first verse. This is the Word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and this is the second death. Amen, and I pray that God will bless to us this reading of his word. If the boys and girls would like to come and join me down at the front. Should I have said girls and girls? I sometimes think that when we start to think of the children's address, we should stop calling it the children's address, call it what's in the bag. Because it's like every week there's a something appears and we start to wonder what's in here. So I hope you can help me to tell me what some of these funny things are. What's that funny thing? It's a bandage, it's a bandage yeah. Have you ever had to have one of these put on somewhere? These are funny ones because they like stick to themselves. They're really funny ones. So we have a bandage. What else do we have in here? Oh. Here's a funny thing. That's a strange thing. Have you ever seen one of those? No. What might that be for? To wrap around somebody's arm. It's very close to that. This is a thing where you can actually measure someone's blood pressure. Oh. Other things you might recognize. Oh, here we go. Anybody know what this funny thing is? Yeah, it's a thermometer. Let's, well, let's try it out. Probably the only normal thing about me today. <laughs> so a thermometer, you're right. Um, what else is in here? Search things. Ooh. Oh yes. What might be in here? Some tablets. Yeah. This is paracetamol. Well, it's American paracetamol, which is the only reason you can get 225 of them as opposed to just 16 here. And one of the most important things written on this. For a children's address is instructions to me because it says, keep away from young children. That's what it says on that. So be very careful with that. So all of those sorts of things are for looking after people who are, yeah, are injured or sick or not well. And what I think is fantastic about these 
And we just read about it. Did you know we just read about these in the Bible? Nobody know, no. What's interesting about these is when we go to heaven, we don't need any of these. We won't need any of these things at all. I've used them in my, in my job when I work, but we won't need any of them at all. Isn't that a nice idea? Because God has promised us that there'll be no more crying, and then there'll be no more pain, and there'll be no more death, and all of those things when we go to heaven. So all of those things we won't need anymore. And that's really good news. We're going to sing your song now. I normally forget this and leave it up there and then don't know what the children's song is, but it's Jesus Loves Me. Let's stand and sing to God's praise. God, we present our gifts before you as an expression of our service and for the work of your kingdom. And with these gifts, we also bring you our lives for you to work in and through us for the advancement of your kingdom and to the glory of your name. For Christ's sake, amen. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's a privilege to be back with you again. And what I'd said the very first time I was here was I'd look forward to being able to work through a series through the whole of the book of Philippians. I'm, trust me, I'm as excited as you are that you now have leave to call and you'll not have to put up with me for much longer. Um, but it's, it's a joy to be able to work through one of these passages, one of these books we're going to read now from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, this time from the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. This is the Word of God. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, 
being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. And I pray again that God will bless this reading of his word. continue in our worship of our God, let's come before him now again in prayer, this time bringing our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we bow in prayer before you this morning, we bring you our thanks. You've taught us in Paul's letter to the Philippians that giving thanks to you is one of the ways that we receive your peace. Paul wrote that we should rejoice in the Lord always, he said. I I will say it again, rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so that is how we pray to you this morning. Your word tells us, Lord, not to be anxious about anything, so we set our anxiety down here before you in prayer. Those anxious thoughts about those things that concern us. And we are grateful and we realize that you tell us to do that about every situation. For nothing is too small or too great for you to manage. And with our prayers and, and our petition, as Paul teaches us, we bring you our thanks. Our thanks for so many things with which you enrich our lives. And in that spirit of thankfulness, we here this morning present to you our requests. Mixing our thanks with our requests, we name them before you in this silence in the bottom of our hearts and in the midst of our anxiety. Lord, having laid before you our anxious thoughts, we would claim for ourselves the promise from your word that follows the doing of these things. Your word tells us that having done these things, that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So in your mercy, hear our prayer. For we bring them to you in the name of your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I invite you to join with me in standing and singing our next praise, which is Ancient of Days. Let's stand and praise our God.
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable, O Lord, in your sight, both now and forever. Amen. This beautiful section in Paul's letter to the Philippians is bracketed by the word, therefore, and hearing at its beginning and at the beginning of the subsequent section, so it's impossible to view it out of context of the surrounding text, so we will dip in and out of those pieces as well, and hopefully that gives us the three points to, to anchor our thoughts for today. So Paul is calling us here to have a common purpose, a common mindset, and a common behavior in these verses. So what's his common purpose that he's talking about that prompts him to begin this with a a, a therefore? Well, he's just finished another well-known section up above in in the end of chapter 1 where he proclaims that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain, writing as he is from prison into which he'd been thrown for proclaiming the good news about Jesus. In in verse 27 of chapter 1 there, after talking about whether he lives or is put to death, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving, striving together as one person for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them, he says, that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. All of Paul's following remarks that he makes about chapter 2 and chapter 2 are set in the context of what we've just read there. They're, They're set in this context of the Philippians facing opposition because they are working together to proclaim the gospel of Christ. That's That is their common purpose. Standing firm in one spirit, as he said, contending as one person for the faith of the gospel. It's something they have in common with Paul, and it's something they have in common with each other. It's something that has great significance for yourselves as you've now been given leave to call and think of calling your new minister who, with whom you will all be working with this commonality of purpose, this one purpose of proclaiming the gospel. Paul makes it very clear elsewhere in his writing that, as he says in in, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, he says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's the context in which you are working together to that one purpose. We're soon on on our um, son and our daughters, each of their wedding anniversaries around the same time as ours, and I was reflecting recently on how a very different world they were embarking out on uh, in their new married, as a newly married couple, compared to the one that, that Carol and I started out with. Societal norms have drifted even further again from Christian values. Uh, from what were normal things when when we got married. Uh, And they too, like the Philippians, will indeed be striving together as one for the faith of the gospel in this context. So all Paul's remarks that he's about to make in chapter 2, in terms of their common mindset, flow out of and are a consequence of the fact that they are, in the face of opposition to the gospel, standing firm, as if they were one person and striving or or contending or or fighting on behalf of the gospel of Christ. 
it does make us pose a question to ourselves, which is that, is there any aspect of our life where we actually don't feel as if we are running counter to the society in which we live? This is a society that, uh, whose ways and whose attitudes and intentions and, and whose uh, beliefs and purposes are, are very different from ours as believers. So if there is an element to which we don't have some discomfort or some um, conflict with the world, I think we have to start asking ourselves how closely we're aligned to Scripture or to the society in which we live. Something to consider. So common purpose, common mindset is what we then move on to in chapter 2. Uh, to borrow Paul's, therefore, this section of chapter 2 of his letter can't simply be seen as just a few warm, fuzzy words of encouragement or, or a set of high ideals of how it might be good for uh, a group of individuals just to get along well together. The words are, are spoken to people who are working together with a common purpose of declaring the gospel of Christ in the face of, a, of a, an opposing world. And it's because of the commonality of their faith, of their being united in this common purpose of proclaiming the gospel, that Paul asks them to have this common mindset. This, this appeal to the people to be of one mind, it, it's to be motivated entirely by the example of Christ that he then illustrates. So within this section, Paul begins to describe the attitudes and intentions that they are aspire to and the motivation which should be theirs to help them to achieve this. Interestingly, this, this appeal by Paul for, for a unity it isn't based on the way people either think or feel about each other. They're, they're not to derive their attitudes by how much they like the people that they're with in, in the church. They're to derive their attitudes from, uh, towards each other from the attitudes that they see exemplified and shown by Christ. Verses 1 and 2, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. As I've said before, I do think at times it's difficult for, for those of us when we've read the same passage of Scripture again and again many times, it's difficult to, to look at it with fresh eyes or fresh ears. And There are now so many versions, so many translations and paraphrases of Scripture available to us in, in English. Um, we're, we're very blessed in, in how we can see it and read it in different ways. And I know that it comes to a huge surprise to many uh, Northern Irish students who head out to, to universities uh, across the water to find that uh, NIV actually stands for New International Version and not uh, Northern Irish Version. It's, it's actually... Uh, and we have, a, we have a good friend who works as a uh, youth worker, or, or he helped me explain that it's actually youth uh, with two O's uh, in the middle to say it properly. Um, so, for me, what was helpful was to think of how young people would consider these verses. And if you think that there, the word asks us here, do you think there might be a tiny bit of encouragement for being one with Jesus? So the young people would say, really? Even a small bit of encouragement? But Paul's trying to make us see that such is the love that Jesus has shown us. Such is the huge privilege of being made one with Christ. And so amazing are the examples of his tenderness and compassion shown to us. How can we not show and do the same? How then do we, how then do, we do the same in a practical, day-to-day -day manner? How, how do we 
do the same mirroring of Christ's behavior. So for me, the two big phrases that stand out within this, uh, they're almost like a call and answer piece. Uh, In verse 3, we have do nothing. And then over in verse 14, we have do everything. So let let me elaborate. Verses 3 and 4 say, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. So there's a challenge for us. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And that really does mean nothing. Picture that for a moment. Literally every action relating to other people must not be done out of your own selfish ambition, but out of a consideration for them. And for me, I actually think that this is part of how Paul is seeking to engineer their unity. By having the Philippians look away from themselves and their own wants and their own needs to the wants and needs of others. I've, I'm sure like you read many definitions of, uh, of humility, <clears throat> each with its own merits, but I particularly like the one uh, attributed to, to Andy Murray. Uh, not Andy Murray, the tennis player, not him. No, uh, Andrew Murray, the, um, uh, I think he was the 19th century pastor, who said, the humble person is not someone who thinks poorly of himself. He simply doesn't think of himself at all. If you hear to Christ's own words in Matthew 16, 24, where we read, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's this losing of their lives, this denying of themselves, this concept, as it says in verse 5, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, well, you might not be God, but many of us behave at times as if we were in a way, lording it over each other. Uh, one of our good friends, uh, not that terribly long ago, retired from a very senior position in, in the civil service and was awarded an OBE. And he then gave us a, a very charming description of the different um, uh, Queen's honours. And uh, this wasn't my year, by the way. Uh, so, uh, but he, he listed these out and what they were. And uh, one is the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George. And it's got these various, let's just call them post-nominals or letters that come after, you know, such as Knight Grand Cross or Knight Commander or, or Companion and so on. And they're variously listed with their, their little three or four letter acronym is CMG or KCMG or GCMG and so on. Our friend explained that within the service, they're actually rather unkindly um, explained in a slightly different way. So I listed one of them, which is CMG uh, and KCMG. And he said, they're somewhat sarcastically referred to as CMG is call me God. And KCMG is kindly call me God. Uh, and GCMG, which is the George and so on, is, is God calls me God. Uh, so although that, that does rather poke fun at these terribly high human secular honors, we can think a little too well of ourselves around others and not think of them. But even in the absence of having such tit- titles, it's very easy to fall into that trap of the mother of uh, the two disciples who came to Jesus asking them for a seat of importance at his right and left hand. And she failed to understand that which Jesus, which had so gently demonstrated, not actually that long beforehand, by washing the disciples' feet. John 13, 12, we read, when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place 
Do you understand what I've done for you? He said, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So a common purpose, common mindset, and then if that's to be their common mindset of servanthood, of humility, of self-denial, what then is to be their common behavior? Well, we come now to that second, therefore, that brackets these verses. Therefore, in verse 12, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And here comes the do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. So here then is that do everything, which I mentioned earlier as the, the, the flip side of the do nothing from earlier. Do everything, he says, without grumbling or arguing. I look forward to hearing about the dishes later today, by the way. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure Like I said, that includes loading and unloading the dishwasher or taking the bin out or tidying your room or being the one to get up and put another shovel of coal on. I mean, not today, but... So how on earth do we do that? How do we attain to that? Spoken before and, and commented before about it's very wrong for a preacher to come and preach to people to live better but not tell them how to do so. And the answer to all of that is in the phrase which so beautifully holds the two aspects together in their proper tension, as we read in verse 12. Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In addition to verse 13, where we, where we read, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In our fallenness, we can do none of this in our own strength. Especially we consider what a huge set of mountains to climb those two concepts are. That concept of do nothing out of selfish ambition and the do everything without arguing or complaining. It is all too easy to look behind us at our past failures even this morning as we were getting ready to come here and allow them to hold us back. But, but please let us, let us be encouraged by Paul's words later in, on in this letter that we'll come to in chapter 3 where he says, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, he says, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We can't do this in our own strength but we can do it in God's. 
We have a common purpose, which is the spreading of the gospel of Christ, a responsibility for us all. And we should be having a common mindset, that of Christ, the servant, doing nothing out of selfish ambition. And we have a common behavior, doing everything without complaining or arguing as we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For mercifully, it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Amen. And I pray that God will bless to us this preaching of his word. We're going to stand again to sing our closing hymn, hymn number 514, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen.